Today's episode is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. The 2023 Black Friday and holiday offer has been extended, so stay tuned to find out how you can get up to six months of Surfshark VPN for free. Hello, and welcome to my channel. Vice Rhino here. Today, I'm looking at a video from the World Video Bible School with the unfortunately named apologist Kyle Butt. I mean, it could be worse. His parents could have named him Harold or Seymour or Richard. Richard works at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta. Poor guy. Anyway, this video seeks to answer the question, where did all the dinosaurs go? Which is an easy enough answer for those of us who don't need to cram hundreds of millions of years into a mere 6,000 in order to answer the question, not to mention the billions of years that the entire universe has been around for. The simplified explanation is that an asteroid impact resulted in a significant shift in climate for several years, which the majority of the dinosaur species were unable to survive. But let's see how Mr. Butt answers the question. But first, a word from our sponsor, Surfshark. How many video streaming services do you have in order to always have fresh content available? One, two, four, maybe more? How much is all that streaming costing you per month? More and more people are looking for ways to reduce costs and Surfshark VPN has a possible solution. By streaming via Surfshark, you can access streaming services from different geographical locations. This means that you may have access to additional libraries of movies and TV shows not available in your home area. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network which allows you to appear to be connected to the internet from any location where Surfshark has a server. So if you're in Canada, but you want some of that sweet, sweet American Hulu, then with just a few easy clicks, you can be binging all 10 seasons of 90 Day Fiance, if that's your thing. And if you're in Montana, North Carolina, Louisiana, Virginia, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Utah, you probably already know why you want a VPN. So yeah, y'all should definitely be signing up now. With Surfshark's Clean Web 2.0 features, you can also automatically block ads, reject unwanted cookies without fumbling through the pop-up first, get alerts when a website was the target of a data breach, and block malware. Surfshark adds an extra layer of encryption to your data so that not even your internet service provider can snoop on you. And personally, I never connect to a public Wi-Fi network without it. Surfshark VPN is easy to use and simple to install, and it does not monitor, track, or store your data, and it works on phones, tablets, and laptops with no extra fees. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee so you can try it out completely risk-free. For a limited time, Vice Rhino listeners can get an exclusive Surfshark deal. Enter the promo code RHINO to get up to six additional months for free at surfshark.deals slash RHINO. Again, that's surfshark.deals slash R-H-I-N-O and enter promo code RHINO to get up to six additional months for free. This is a limited time offer, so sign up today. And remember, by signing up for Surfshark VPN, you're helping to support my channel. So thank you. You can go to a zoo and you can see a hippopotamus, you can see a koala bear, you can see a kangaroo, but if you want to see a dinosaur, going to the zoo isn't going to get you there, is it? Yes, it is, because birds are dinosaurs, and most zoos have at least a few bird exhibits. I know modern birds aren't what people generally think of when they hear the word dinosaur. Most people would imagine the big ones, like sauropods, tyrannosaurs, ceratopsians, and, you know, stuff like that. But as creationists will often themselves point out, most dinosaurs were actually quite small, and many of the theropods skirt the line between bird and dinosaur very, very closely. Like Microraptor, which was about the size of a raven, was completely covered with feathers, was at least able to glide, but may have also been capable of powered flight, but also was definitely not a bird, having teeth, a bony tail, and fingered claws on their forelimbs. There's a whole category of dinosaurs that are colloquially referred to as the bird-like dinosaurs, and plenty of them have features that we generally associate with birds rather than dinosaurs today, so... Yeah, birds are dinosaurs. Because you can't see a Tyrannosaurus rex at the zoo. You can't see an Apatosaurus. You can't see a Pachycephalosaurus. And why not? Because they did. The simple answer is dinosaurs are extinct. So how do we know that they ever lived? Well, we can find their fossils and we can know they once lived, but today we don't find them on our planet alive and so they are labeled extinct. I see that Kyle hasn't gotten any better at writing his scripts over the years. It's rather unfortunate for a guy representing an organization that calls itself a school. When we study dinosaurs, we quickly realize that because they're extinct, most of us want to know what happened to all the dinosaurs. Why were there dinosaurs in the past, but there are not dinosaurs now? Asteroid, go boom! Bada boom! <laughs> Where did all the dinosaurs go? To hell, of course, for being the tools that Satan uses to turn kids into evil, evolution-believing atheists. That's a very good question. 
And that is the equivalent of the writer of a terrible movie, including a line in their script where one of the characters says, I don't believe it. This would be the sort of thing you would see in a Hollywood blockbuster. And in order to answer it, we first got to get some things straight. You see, dinosaur extinction is interesting to us because they were such amazing creatures. That is certainly a part of it, but really, there's not anything inherently amazing about them. Like, sure, plenty of them were quite big, but the biggest animal ever known to exist is still alive today, the blue whale, which is about 30 times the size of a T-Rex. There were some sauropods that were a bit longer than blue whales, but by mass, the whales dominate. I think the fascination with dinosaurs goes beyond a mere, these things were impressive. Thinking about the time when dinosaurs were the dominant animals on the planet brings us the closest we are likely to ever come to being able to imagine what life would be like on an alien planet. It's far enough along in Earth's history to not just be primitive sea life, there's vibrant and flourishing flora and fauna, but strange reptiles that are, with the exception of the bird-like ones, pretty distinct from anything that's around today. So it's not merely thing big, me like. It's that they are part of a world that is similar enough to our own to be familiar, but different enough to feel like something new that captures our interest. But extinction is not rare. Many of the animals that lived in the past are now extinct. In fact, it's been suggested that a very large percentage of all the animals that once lived on our planet no longer live. Yes, it has been estimated that over 99.9% .9 of all organisms that have ever existed are now extinct, which makes perfect sense given evolution in billions of years. A billion years is a long time. There's some evidence that the first life on Earth began 3.8 billion years ago, with the first fossils being 3.5 billion years old. Speciation is something that even creationists must agree happens, because without it, there's no way to have fit all of the animals on the Ark. I mean, even with it, there are still severe challenges beyond just a lack of physical space, but I covered that in other videos. I'll leave a card to one of those if you want. Creationists believe that some 1,400 kinds were present on Noah's Ark, and that these 1,400 kinds evolved into the 5.6 million species of land animal that are estimated to exist today, which would require the evolution of about 3.8 new species per day for the entire 4,000 years since they believe that Noah got off his boat. If we cut this rapid evolutionary rate down to three species per year, that means that at a rate of evolution that is two orders of magnitude slower than creationists believe in, over the course of 3.8 billion years, we should have 14.4 billion species having existed. There are an estimated 8.75 million species currently alive once you add the plants, bacteria, fungi, and whatnot back into the mix instead of just looking at terrestrial animals, which is 0.06% of the total to ever live, according to this calculation. This leaves us with 99.94% of all species to ever have existed having gone extinct, which fits the so-called secular data pretty nicely for a back-of-the-envelope calculation. Creationists would be better off ignoring this because they often feel the need to include extinct species on the Ark, and that severely messes with the numbers here. If they agree that 99.9% .9 of species are extinct, then that not only calls into question the ultimate purpose of Noah's Ark, but it also drastically increases the number of animals that had to be on the Ark, and then has to account for how rapidly they were going extinct, even as new species were evolving at a rate of nearly four per day. Like, to keep the proportion correct, that means that every day, four new species evolved, and 40,000 went extinct. That's just bonkers. And it's especially true that many of the larger animals that lived in the past, like dinosaurs, are no longer around today. I'd be inclined to say the opposite, actually. Certainly, to our human brains that are impressed by things like size, it seems most striking that the big guys are no longer with us, but far more small organisms have gone extinct than large organisms. Like, how many species of bacteria and archaea went extinct in the two and a half billion years during which they were the only categories of life to exist? It's a hard number to estimate, especially given how horizontal gene transfer messes with the phylogenies of such organisms, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than the total number of large land animals to ever exist combined. And that's to say nothing of the abundant sea creatures like trilobites, of which we have discovered some 20,000 species. For comparison, there are only about 800 known species of non-avian dinosaur in total. So yeah, given this information, I'm definitely on the it's not especially true that many of the larger animals have gone extinct side of the fence, given that the small species are so overwhelming in number, both in the fossil record and as they exist today. Also, most people who talk about dinosaur extinction, well, they say it happened millions of years ago, long before these dinosaurs, they evolved and died out millions of years before humans arrived on the scene.
Correct. They died out about 65 million years ago, and humans didn't evolve until about 2 million years ago. Though it's also worth mentioning that numbers this big are difficult to comprehend. Most people, even those who know better, think of the time of the dinosaurs as a bit of a monolith. If it was a dinosaur, it existed in the time of the dinosaurs, and they're long dead. But that's mainly because we can't really comprehend just how long they were around for. We actually live closer to when the T-Rex was alive than the T-Rex did to when Stegosaurus was alive. This isn't entirely relevant, but it does help to understand just how long the dinosaurs were around for. But that's simply not possible. For the simple reason that dinosaurs were created on day six of the creation week, the same day as humans. Yeah, if you start with the belief that the Bible provides a literal and accurate description of the origin of the Earth and its contents, then something that was supposed to have been created on the same day as humans, having gone extinct millions of years before humans evolved, would be impossible. But since that belief is demonstrably wrong, that doesn't really matter. Like, I get that this is supposed to be answering questions that Christians might have about how all this works, so presumably Kyle's target audience already believes that the Bible is accurate, but the whole the Bible says it so despite all the data to the contrary it has to be true thing just doesn't sit well with me and didn't sit well with me when I was a creationist. I've mentioned this in a few videos, but it's worth bringing up every now and again, because sometimes out of convenience I have referred to myself as a former Young Earth creationist. This is not entirely accurate. I was an evolution-denying creationist, to be sure, but I had quite a bit of cognitive dissonance going on. I never could quite bring myself to form a firm opinion on the age of the Earth. As far as evolution was concerned, I found the arguments from Answers in Genesis to be the most compelling, because they actually use science-y sounding stuff. But as soon as the age of the Earth came up, they had no good arguments, even to me, someone who was already primed to believe them. Regarding the age of the Earth and universe, their only argument was a calculation based on biblical genealogies, with there not even being much of a pretense to having science back up their calculation. For me, the main issue was the distant starlight problem. We can see objects in the sky that Answers in Genesis will admit are billions of light years away, which means that for the light to reach us, it would have to have been in transit for billions of years. The ways that they attempt to solve this problem just seemed completely ad hoc to me, like claiming that the speed of light was different in the past, or that God created the universe with light already in transit. Which by extension would mean that he created the illusion of stars that went supernova without ever having created that star in the first place, since we've observed supernovae that are more than 6,000 light years away. In fact, there was one on May 19th of 2023 that was 21 million light years away. So if God created light in transit, that means that the stars that went nova never actually existed. He just created light and gravitational waves that would look like a star going nova. How many of the stars in the sky just flat out don't exist according to this model? And on top of that, this amounts to being essentially the astronomical version of an argument that most creationists reject about fossils. The idea that God put them there either to provide us with a rich experience in studying them, or as a test of faith, rather than them being actually representative of organisms that really existed. I say this to point out that answering a question with what amounts to the Bible said so wasn't even convincing to me as someone who wholeheartedly believed the Bible. Because if the Bible is true, then a study of reality should match up with what the Bible says with without having to contort reality to make it match. So when all the data says that the speed of light in a vacuum is a constant, and we can see things that are billions of light years away, that necessitates a universe that is billions of years old. When I was a creationist, I never quite formed my beliefs about the age of the universe. I just kind of indefinitely put off looking into it. Neither dinosaurs nor, nor humans ever evolved over millions of years, but they were created instantaneously by God fully formed. If that were the case, and they were created on the same day and the fossil record was mostly laid down by Noah's flood, then you'd expect to regularly find human fossils in the same strata as the non-avian dinosaurs. But alas, we do not. Human remains are consistently separated from the non-avian dinosaurs by tens of millions of years worth of strata. Furthermore, the Earth is not millions or billions of years old. Whatever happened to the dinosaurs did not happen millions of years ago. We know this because we have lots of evidence that humans and dinosaurs lived together only a few thousand years ago. No, we really don't. The examples that he's visually showing are very much not evidence of human coexistence with dinosaurs. 
One is an Ica stone, which are items that are regularly faked to sell to tourists. We even know the name of the guy who started faking them, Basilo Ushuya. I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. What's worse is that if we assume that the Ica stones are genuine and provide evidence of humans living with dinosaurs, then why are they not also evidence of aliens performing brain surgery on humans, or the ancient Peruvians having developed a telescope? Next is a carving from the Kachina Bridge site in Utah. The carving looks vaguely like a sauropod, but it's vague enough that it could easily have meant something completely different to whoever originally carved it, but it does look like a sauropod to those of us who are familiar with it, because of pareidolia. But while that is the easy explanation, when looking into it, it turns out that an analysis of the carving shows that it's actually a composite of two carvings that were made at two different times, and a mineral or mud stain, which, when made more clear, looks something like this. The torso and tail of the carving are separate entities, and the tool marks used to make them indicate that they were carved with a different style, probably by a different person. What appear to be legs are a mineral or mud stain that appears superficially to be part of the carving, but are actually just discoloration of the rock. And what's more, creationists have to crank the contrast up and then fill in what they think is the outline in order to make it appear as distinct as it usually is shown. This is what an unaltered photo of the carving looks like. Interestingly, when I bump the contrast up on this one to make it more visible, the spiral in front of the supposed head gets equally more visible. But that part is always left off of the creationist images depicting this carving, which suggests that they are intentionally omitting it, rather than it just being not as prominent. And frankly, that's enough to dismiss this one. If you have to intentionally omit part of the image in order to make your argument work, then your argument doesn't work. The third item is a sculpture, presumably of an Apatosaurus, though it looks to me more like a dog with a long neck. And it appears to be one of the Akambaro figurines. Again, sorry for the pronunciation. This is another fake archaeological find, which has been dated using thermoluminescence dating to the 1930s. And I'm not even sure what the last item is, it looks like a bit of leather. Given that we're three for three so far on these things being either frauds or modern interpretation being imposed on ancient images that, when studied closely, don't even begin to resemble what creationists claim, I feel safe just offhandedly dismissing the fourth item. Besides, if Kyle's not going to go into detail explaining what these things are, then I've already wasted too much time on it when I could have just said, nuh uh. Another thing that we sometimes hear about dinosaur extinction is that mammals began to evolve and eat the dinosaur eggs, killing the dinosaurs. I've actually never heard that one, but like, Predators that focus on eggs have existed for pretty much as long as eggs have existed. I could maybe see that being a factor in a single species extinction, but to cause the extinction of an entire group of animals as diverse as the dinosaurs of the late Cretaceous, it just seems implausible. As far as I'm aware, we don't even have any evidence to suggest that mammals ate any dinosaur eggs. So to conclude that mammals eating dino eggs was such a pervasive behavior that it actually caused the non-avian dinosaurs to go extinct, and yet none of this behavior is evidenced by any of the mammal fossils from the time is just plain ridiculous. Like, surely some mammals did eat dino eggs at least occasionally. It would be really weird if they didn't, especially given that modern mammals do frequently eat modern dinosaur eggs. I had some for breakfast myself. But the level of egg eating required to wipe out all of the non-avian dinosaurs would surely leave some trace in the fossil record. The problem with ideas like this is that neither dinosaurs nor mammals evolved millions of years after or before each other. The first things that we could properly call mammals evolved in the late Triassic. The Triassic was the first period of the Mesozoic era, which was the time of the dinosaurs. So yes, mammals have been around for most of the time that the dinosaurs were. And while we don't have evidence of mammals eating dino eggs, we do have evidence of dinosaurs eating mammals. Not entirely relevant here, but interesting nonetheless. All the land-living creatures were made on day six of creation. That means dinosaurs and mammals would have lived together from the very beginning of time. Okay, it seems as though Kyle is under the impression that most evolutionists don't think that mammals lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, which is weird given that he also just presented mammals eating dino eggs as one hypothesis of dinosaur extinction that evolutionists would hold to. If we didn't think that dinos and mammals coexisted, how would mammals eat dino eggs, Kyle? Any ideas about extinction that include something evolving millions of years afterward or anything like that, they simply aren't scientifically correct, they're not biblically correct, and they're not historically accurate. Well, they are scientifically accurate, as can be demonstrated by the fact that the percentage of scientists who will tell you that these things are scientifically accurate approaches the same percentage as species that have gone extinct. The exception are the handful of credentialed creationists who disagree. 
As to biblically accurate, if the Bible were an accurate book, we wouldn't need to worry about making things fit with it. Things just would fit with it. We'd study the Earth and find that every data point about it suggests that it is young and that there was a catastrophic flood that covered the whole thing a mere 4,000 years ago. Historically accurate is essentially meaningless here, as these events are not historical in the sense that we're trying to piece together what happened from written accounts, though I could see why a young Earth creationist would make that mistake. Now, many scientists who teach evolution and talk about those millions of years and dinosaurs evolving into something else like birds, they teach that there was a huge asteroid that was about six miles wide that 65 million years ago hit the Earth and caused events that ultimately led to the extinction of dinosaurs. Yes. And this is a very minor nitpick, but I find it amusing that whatever graphic you've either commissioned or borrowed from other sources for this has the impact happening in the United States in between Florida and New York. Like, Mexico is right there, visible on that globe in your own image. Could it just smush the impact video down to overlap with where it actually happened? Though I suppose if we're going to be concerned about accuracy, I should also be complaining that the continents weren't quite shaped like that when the impact happened either. Supposedly this happened on the Yucatan Peninsula, and there's a huge crater called Chicxulub that's about 112 miles in diameter. Okay, so you do know that it happened there rather than in Tennessee or whatever. Notice his language shift, though. The impact supposedly happened, but the crater is there. It is an undeniable fact that there is a crater there. It is so undeniable that not even a young Earth creationist can deny it. And scientists believe that this crater is evidence that their theory is right. Yes, but there's more to the story than that. Luis and Walter Alvarez published the hypothesis that an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs in 1980. The Chicxulub crater was discovered in 1978 by Glenn Penfield, but publication of that discovery was delayed until the 1990s. Penfield worked for a Mexican oil company that prohibited him from publishing his findings, and it wasn't connected to the extinction of the dinosaurs until a reporter who knew of Penfield's discovery mentioned it to Alan Hildebrand, who was a graduate student who worked with the Alvarezes when they were writing their paper in the 1980s. The initial paper in 1980 contained numerous predictions about what we would expect to find if the dinosaurs were killed by an asteroid impact, and the Chicxulub crater fit the predictions perfectly. It's not that they tried to make it look like it fit post hoc, they published their predictions in advance, and the predictions came true with infinitely more precision than the most robust prophecy in the Bible. Which admittedly is a very low bar, but they actually crossed a pretty high bar for this one. And it's not just the impact itself that was predicted, it was also the existence of specific types of ejecta, like tech Tights, little glass balls that formed when material from the impact flies into the atmosphere and then returns, becoming superheated in the process. Not only have we found tectites that are in the exact strata that we would expect from the Chicxulub impact, but we have found fossil fish with these tectites in their gills, indicating that they actually died on the day that the asteroid hit. It's really quite remarkable. But there are several problems with this idea. First, evolutionist ideas about 65 million years, well, those aren't correct. Because Bible. We have found dinosaur fossils that have soft tissue still in them that couldn't possibly have lasted 65 million years. How do you know they couldn't have lasted that long? Were you there? Wait, that's Ken Ham's thing. I think. After all these years, all these creationists are kind of blending together. But they do copy off each other so much that I wonder if it's even worth distinguishing between them at this point anyway. Okay, back on topic, soft tissue. Long story short, the tissue that was found was not unaltered original material. It's material that morphologically can be identified as certain proteins, but molecularly they have been altered by a process called crosslinking that aids in its preservation. Worth mentioning is that these materials are only found deep within the bones where they would be the most protected over the years, and we only find microscopic amounts of them after dissolving the hard bits away in an acid bath. I'll leave a card to a playlist containing a bunch of videos that go into more detail about the whole soft tissue thing, so go watch that if this brief overview wasn't enough for you. My most recent video on the topic is first on the list because it has some more recent research than the Stated Clearly video, but the Stated Clearly video is still excellent. In fact, I think I'll end this section with a quote from that video regarding what it would mean if the fossils that we find soft tissue in were actually young, rather than the soft tissue either being from contamination or the result of an at the time undiscovered preservation method that was able to preserve it for millions of years. Quote, the fossil had been found in a set of rock layers known as the Cretaceous, ancient sediments laid down between 145 to 66 million years ago. 
Our understanding of the age of these rocks is founded on thousands of data points telling us how rock layers form, on careful study of the rise and fall of various ecosystems and animal groups in the fossil record, and on the clear results of hundreds of experiments on radiometric dating. Many overlapping radiometric dating methods have been used to confirm the age range of Cretaceous rocks, and the results have been independently checked by laboratories around the globe. To successfully argue that her single discovery means that the fossil is actually young, she would have to ignore everyone else's careful observations. Second, in very recent studies, it's been discovered that many of the same animals and plants that were alive before the event, well, they were still alive many years after the event. Yeah, obviously. Nobody is suggesting that the event that killed the dinosaurs completely wiped out all life, but it wiped out enough life to call it an extinction event and to use it as the marker defining the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods. And scientists have discovered that even if there was a huge impact, it didn't cause the animals and the plants in that area to become completely extinct. I think Kyle might actually think that extinction event means that absolutely everything on the planet went extinct and life had to start again from scratch. My dude, the evolutionary model says that it took more than a billion years just for life to get from single-celled to multicellular, and then another couple billion years before animals really got going in the Cambrian. And now you're suggesting that we think this whole thing happened all over again, but in one-fifth the amount of time? If that's honestly what you believe that we believe, then no wonder you can't believe it. But you being wrong about what an extinction event is does not make evolution wrong. And third, many animals that we know lived before or during the time of dinosaurs, well, they're still alive today. Many is more than a bit of a stretch here. Yes, there are some animals that we refer to as living fossils, but we're talking like tens of species at best. Probably not even that, as the lists of 10 animals that lived with the dinosaurs have to resort to things like calling Steropodon a platypus. Sure, it's categorized as a platypus-like monotreme, but nobody would look at that beside a modern duck-billed platypus and conclude that they're the same type of animal. The animals that are around today that could be said to have lived with the dinosaurs are similar to the versions that were actually alive back then, but not identical. Evolution has carried on, and while general body plans sometimes remain consistent, the specifics have not. Coelacanth, for instance, has been determined through genetic analysis to be relatively slow to evolve, but the two extant species that we know of diverged about six million years ago, indicating that evolution is still happening. Sharks are often used as the quintessential example of a living fossil, but after examining a remarkably well-preserved fossil of a 325 million year old shark, it was discovered that modern sharks have evolved considerably from their ancient ancestors. In a live science interview, the author of that study said that comparing a modern shark to an ancient one would be the equivalent of comparing a modern car to the Model T. There are similarities, sure, but they are still vastly different. For instance, sharks were supposed to be alive during the age of the dinosaurs, but they're still alive. Ah, there it is, the good old predictable shark. Definitely didn't see that one coming. Why didn't the impact kill them? Well, being underwater certainly would have helped with surviving the rain of fire that the asteroids sent over the entire Earth, and the fact that they tend to hunt in deeper water means that the prey that they were hunting would have been similarly protected. In fact, when looking at how the impact affected various types of organisms, land environments lost around 75% of all of their species, marine environments lost about half, and freshwater environments only lost between 10 and 22%, depending on the specific environment. Animals that live in freshwater environments are more likely to have adaptations to surviving cold winters with minimal food resources, so that made it easier for them to adapt to the cold that followed the initial impact and the collapse of the food chain that was caused by the fact that photosynthesis wouldn't have been possible in the months following the impact. So only plants that were adapted to go into dormant periods during harsh conditions were able to survive. But the animals that rely on those plants for food weren't as fortunate. One of the reasons that birds survived, while other dinosaurs, even ones of similar sizes, were not able to, is because of their loss of teeth. Birds that had toothless beaks were more able to make use of the nuts and seeds during the time after the impact, so they were able to outcompete their toothed relatives. The mammals most able to survive were small burrowing creatures that could have sheltered underground from the initial firestorm of the impact and relied on insects as their food source. Insects that could eat decaying organic matter and so were not entirely reliant on photosynthesis for their own survival. And those are just some of the ways that some of these organisms could have survived. The truth is, since God created all the kinds of animals on days five and six of creation, then all of the animals that are now living would have lived through the event. Okay, so why don't we see fossils of modern organisms in the layers before the asteroid? 
I don't mean something that is similar but a different species once you look at the details, I'm talking about something completely indistinguishable from a modern organism. Forget the platypus-like monotremes, where are the actual platypuses? Platypodes? Platypi? One of those. Where are the Precambrian bunnies? Where are the Jurassic woodcocks? Why are all the fossils separated so perfectly if they were all caused by the same event? Should there not be at least occasional out-of-place fossils? I'd think that would be the norm rather than the exception, but y'all can't even find a single exception. What could cause such a crash to destroy only the dinosaurs and not the lions and tigers or Komodo dragons? Lions, tigers, and Komodo dragons, oh my, evolved much later than the extinction event. So I guess they survived by not existing yet? Well, the truth is, dinosaurs didn't go extinct because of a huge asteroid millions of years ago. So how do you explain all the data that suggests that they did? Do you explain it by saying Bible? You explain it by saying Bible, don't you? So why did they go extinct? Well, the best answer is that many dinosaurs would have died in the global flood of Noah. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a point for that prediction. That is basically just saying Bible. Now, I'll be reasonable though, I will take that point away if he even attempts to explain the Chicxulub crater. Since the whole world was flooded, only those dinosaurs that were on the ark that Noah built would have been saved. Yes, but the whole point of putting them on the ark was to, as you said, save them. Why would God bother saving them just to let them go extinct afterwards? I don't know, maybe the non-avian dinosaurs were what the other carnivores ate while they waited for their regular prey to repopulate or something? Seems like a weird way to go about doing it, but when has God ever not done things the weird way? And he could have taken young dinosaurs so that they wouldn't have taken up that much room in the ark. Yeah, that's not my main problem with the story. Like, you got a lot of data points you have to explain before we even get to the point where the size of the animals on the ark becomes something that's worth discussing. So that after the flood, we have evidence that humans lived with dinosaurs for many hundreds of years. No, we do not. If we did, you wouldn't need to resort to using known forgeries like the Ica stones in order to support your claim. From the records, it looks like humans interacted with these large reptiles. In fact, we have records that talk about huge reptiles like dinosaurs living at the same time as humans until just a few hundred or thousands of years ago. Oh, let me guess. Dragon legends. You know, dragons, the mythical creatures that until relatively recently were depicted as essentially giant snakes with legs and only became more dinosaur-like in fictional depictions after we discovered dinosaurs? Dinosaurs didn't all die out at one time in a huge event although the flood would have killed many of them. Oh, okay, I see. He's not even going to attempt to give any of his so-called evidence. He's just going to assert it and then move on. Dragons would have been better than that, buddy. Come on, do better. But instead, they gradually died off over time. And you know, them gradually dying off over time perfectly explains why they suddenly stopped appearing in the fossil record right after the asteroid impact that you have acknowledged but so far failed to explain, right? The biblical explanation of dinosaurs living with humans and living through the flood on the ark matches perfectly the real scientific evidence much better than the theories about dinosaur evolution and extinction by an asteroid impact millions of years ago. Thus far, you have demonstrated a complete lack of understanding of even the most rudimentary aspects of the scientific evidence. So forgive me for not being quite able to bring myself to trust you here. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Patrick Poe 5 kl who says, You are evil, but don't worry, you'll meet him one day. Patrick, just think about what you're saying for one second. I am evil, but I'm gonna get mine when God throws me into a lake of fire to be tortured for all of eternity. Like, compare this with a movie. If someone menacingly says, don't worry, you'll meet him one day, about a character that we know is intent on torturing the person on the receiving end of that statement, in what movie would the him in this scenario be the good guy? And don't we get our moral sense from God in your worldview? So why does our moral sense clearly say that God is the bad guy in this scenario? I know that you'll deny that yours does, but I can only hope that you're a better person than you claim to be, and that you know deep down that God is the bad guy, you're just denying that truth in your righteousness. Thanks for watching, I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Service every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern, and with my partner every Thursday at 2pm Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Don't forget to go to surfshark.deal slash rhino to get up to six months for free.
Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorships manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Sophie, Sean Bailey, Michael Baker, and all the rest, who are the asteroid that killed off 100% of living creatures. If you'd like mammals, birds, sharks, and a bunch of other animal groups to survive your 100% deadly event, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time! You wouldn't stop work to put your penis in my mouth? Not recording. <laughs> you look so torn. Yeah, no, I am. Sometimes the skin rips when I pull on it. <laughs> Let me show you how to do it using someone else's mouth.